All right, what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of Academics and Cars. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Please check us out at imixwhatilike.org and at imixwhatilike for all your relevant social media. And today for this edition, we're with my man, Dr. Nathan Connolly. Good morning, good morning. Of the Johns Hopkins University <laughs> here in Baltimore, Maryland. What's up, man? Welcome, man. I'm chilling, man. Thank you for having me in the ride. I appreciate it. Hey. So the, the pleasure is mine and will soon, as people will see, uh, will be ours if they're not already familiar with your work. Um, let's just start with the broad question of, of what is the work that you do? Like, what, what is it? What is your, I, I, you know, race, policy, housing, economics, but, right. but how do you describe your work and, and where you fit in in all of it? Sure, 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 sure. So, you know, I, as, a, as a researcher, I, I really like to focus on uh, 20th century politics and culture. Um, I do work in the United States and increasingly in the Caribbean and wider black world. Um, you know, I have uh, a lot of interests that have to deal with the meeting place of politics and culture and economics and particularly the kinds of pressure that you know capitalism places on people to make certain decisions how institutions are oftentimes run by very consistent economic interests um, and really thinking a lot about how people's political imaginations get formed relative to geographic pressures social pressures family aspirations and so forth um, so i tend to to write in a way that tries to balance economic political and cultural considerations always with an eye on the work that race is doing to really complicate how people are even conceptualizing what's possible. So I'm I'm mostly familiar in terms of your academic work mm -hmm. with uh, your book A World More Concrete, um, and, and I, which I find fascinating, and it's it's more or less set in Miami, right? But I right. think says a lot about wherever you end up finding black people. So. Could we start with just a little bit of what you were doing with that book, A World More Concrete? Sure. Um, yeah, let's just start. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's funny because I think if I had to do it all over again, I would, I would probably take the words South Florida out of the title of the book, A World More Concrete, because I feel like, you know, there's, there's a way in which a lot of urban historians have to do that case study. They really focus on one area um, and really bear down in terms of the specifics, but then sometimes you lose a lot of the universal meanings and themes that then these case studies are exploring, you know? But in, in my case, you know, it was really important on one level to really make sure that people understood that South Florida is a place where a lot of what we imagine to be America's future is already having played out historically there. So you look at a place that had, you know, a black population that was majority immigrant, coming from largely the Bahamas, but also from the wider West Indies. You look at a place that had tremendous linguistic and cultural diversity really from its outset. You know, Miami as a city was only founded in the 1890s, so it is absolutely a child of the Jim Crow era, you know, founded the same year as the Plessy versus Ferguson decision um, in 1896. And so, you know, for me, a lot of what I tried to do with that site was look at all the different things that basically have to happen to make a place America. Right. Mm. Um, and there's a lot that went into, for instance, creating Jim Crow segregation, not out of some old time Southern tradition, but really out of real world contemporaneous economic interests. How do we seg segregate the marketplace in order to create a tourist destination on the beaches, a confined labor force inland? How do we make it a, a stopping point for multinational capital coming up from the Caribbean, going down into the Caribbean and Latin America from the big financial centers of North America, obviously New York and DC um, in diplomatic terms. So, you know, a lot of... I mean, of, it's funny you yeah. say it that way because I, I don't want to go too far yeah, yeah, aside yeah. here, but <laughs> but as, as you're saying that, I'm always... I was just thinking again about how people are always, especially with going on in broader politics with all the, 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 the new... Um, the new red scare we're entering we're in now oh, with the, the, all the anti-russian and all this other stuff yeah but but this question of uh and underneath it always is this communism socialism versus capitalism thing mm. uh isn't so much spoken about today but is i think a clear undercurrent but one of the issues is always that in a communist or socialist state the argument is that everything is planned to the point that people's individuality and, imagina <laughs> and, 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 and imagination can't be enjoyed. Right. But right. as I was even reviewing a world more concrete for this conversation, yeah. your book does like what a lot of good books do is remind us that a lot of what we see in this country, this again, this supposedly free market, dem democratic, capitalist economy, a lot of it is planned. Oh yeah. I mean, it's very meticulously planned. Where will people live? Where will they not live? And even as you point out in the book, 
the 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 invisibilizing of children as they play in in <laughs> playgrounds put underneath overpasses and bridges right, right. building the new southern florida i mean so anyway i just it, 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 Anyway. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, th yeah. th th this this is obviously, you know, uh, you know scholars is, have, have gone over this, you know, for years and years about structure versus agency and how much of this world that we live in is actually of our own making and so on, right? And so much of what I actually do is try to, in some ways, get away from what a lot of our own ideal types are about American culture and society and even international politics, right? About, you know, liberalism and free markets and people's individual choices and actually saying, like, look, we have greater and lesser forms of regulation at various points in time. Jim Crow segregation is absolutely a form of regulation on capitalism. You know, African Americans are trying mightily actually to argue for a freer free market that does not in fact exist relative to their own aspirations to own land, to create businesses, you know, uh, to have a, a form of community self-determination. So, right. so all these ideas that we have about, you know, liberal inclusion and voting as the, the metric or the currency of citizenship, all that stuff is really about ideal types that get mapped back onto the these worlds that you know had a whole lot more going on and, and were oftentimes certainly far more prescriptive about what people could do and so and so it makes it very easy I think for people to understand that relative to say the Jim Crow era because you've got these signs like code only this or you've right. got you know clan and all that and so much of what I try to do in the work is to say you know what Jim Crow is going through its own evolution and the regulatory environment that creates Jim Crow in the late 19th century is actually still with us, but it's been modern, been modernized and it's been improved. And, you know, instead of having now literal concrete walls between neighborhoods that existed in the interest of Jim Crow regulation in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s, now we have overpasses and green spaces and notions of private property that were in fact created in this era and were just easier to translate to the more contemporary era. And so, so I'm really keen on, you know, one of, one of the things that really does define my work as a whole is trying to connect, you know, continuities between the Jim Crow and post Jim Crow era between colonialism and the so-called post-colonial era and and really trying to trouble the terms that we oftentimes use unthinkingly to describe what are basically aspirations or hoped for conditions political conditions that do not in fact exist right we get caught in what we're hoping for and not really one more question I have about this then yeah. to, before I cause start to move into some other areas of of, uh, of your work that have particular interest to in me I think uh, at least um, you in in a world more concrete talk a little bit about the issue of uh, voting and policy and and the way black people but other groups in, in particular black people in particular have tried to or in southern Florida tried to uh, participate in the system and as I think you you said something and ended up participating in the apartheid development of an apartheid situation. Right. Could you explain that a little bit and how that might yeah. relate to other aspects of our lives in this country? Sure, 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 sure. So again, if if you think about the fact that the Jim Crow era lasted, you know, more than seventy years, or you think about the generations of of people and the kinds of work that went into maintaining a kind of white over black order after formal chattel slavery. That, that doesn't happen through simple, you know, white oppression down on kind of unthinking, unmoving black masses, right? That there's in fact a relationship, an administrative relationship that develops. Um, and, and largely what happens, at least in the context of, you know, the post um, emancipation world is this idea that you can turn people who were once property into property owners, into self-maximizing and regulating individuals, right? And so a lot of African Americans, and again, parts of the wider black world, they take this as an opportunity to try to secure their own visions of freedom. And so for me, it's really important to say, you know what, the way that Jim Crow was administered was by providing piecemeal promises about what was possible under capitalism and the, and the so-called sanctity of private property as the, the bedrock of what black politics was going to basically be and do after bondage had occurred. And so you have people obviously more, more most famously Booker T. Washington, Marcus Garvey, who are making ideas about black self-determination that are rooted in ideas about ownership, ideas in some cases about imperial expansion, sometimes colluding directly with imperial governments in the case of the Tuskegee Institute, working to help administer programs in occupied Haiti, working in Togo, working in Cuba. Um, you know, so and, and so much of that administrative African-American history 
is really important for then understanding these connections between the colonized and post-colonized era because we still have, by and large, a series of promises about capitalism providing certain kinds of opportunity, right. the need to have black administrators to demonstrate some kind of legitimacy to these political systems. I mean, Jim Crow, many of the Southern po politicians, people like George Smathers and John Stennis in Mississippi, they would argue that African Americans, in fact, wanted Jim Crow segregation. And they would point to black doctors, black landlords, black physicians as these administrators of black life as evidence of the fact that this was a, a kind of collective, you know, interracial, interracial political project, Jim Crow was. Um, and I argue that, in fact, some of that is indeed true if you look at the ways in which people are moving community agendas in the interest of expanding black property rights or of, in fact, increasing black on black policing. You know, law and order politics are, are a consistent drumbeat in black communities, really from the late 19th through the mid 20th century. And so, you know, a lot of these things that we attribute to backlash politics of a more recent vintage, in fact, are the stuff that made Jim Crow colonialism and colonialism more broadly possible in the first place. And so A World More Concrete is really about you know, trying to illustrate that and, and, and looking at the many of the strange bedfellows that come as a result of these various administrative bargains and compromises. So let me see, let me try this as a segue and, and you'll, you'll make the corrections as necessary. Mm. But, but because one of the, the, the um, ways in which I've come to know your work and, uh, and uh, 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 and have appreciated your your help has been around this issue, the the pet peeve of my own this, of, of of buying power, the right. mythology of buying power, right. and the realities of policy playing a role more than individual or community behavior economically in determining who has what and how much. Right. And so you have, have, have uh, you know, somewhere behind the scenes pointed me in many directions uh, that I still have to keep following up on in terms of the breadth of the history of black economists trying to, or black activists trying to find ways out of these economic inequality, right. conditions of economic inequality. Uh, you put me on to and help, uh, you know, uh, link up with Marissa Baradaran, right. whose work I think has been, continues to be instrumental in, in you know, dismantling, dismantling these myths. So, so in part one, so in, in terms of this segue, I wanted to ask you to, to say a few words about how the, the, your work specifically in terms of policy mm -hmm. and housing right, right. relates to policy and economics. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of what you've talked to me about in terms of the, the history of black people saying, trying to find ways of saying, okay, even if we buy into any aspect of these capitalist mythologies about what we can do to improve our communities, <laughs> we keep running into these obstacles or we just have to fully abandon them as myths. Right. Um, anyway, so, so th th that was my attempt at this segue to say, you know, there is this policy, broader public policy, that, that has more to say about segregated housing and segregated economies. And then the specific segue point, this is, uh, sorry, I almost forgot is where Baradaran talks about how you can't have, because you were talking about how even within black communities suffering Jim Crow, there were arguments for the benefit of this, right. helping black communities. Right. You had black businesses, black this. Right. But as Baradaran points out, you can't make these comparisons and you can't have, or she says you can segregate people, but you cannot segregate money. Right. right. And that in a segregated economy, even where you have black businesses and black institutions, institutions yeah, yeah, yeah. the money that they're dealing with isn't enough to develop the wealth that you have when you're disconnected from the broader white economy, which is, of course, the biggest problem facing right. black segregated reality. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, yeah. so I just said a whole lot trying to draw this segue. <laughs> if you find any threads in there, uh, please pull them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and let's keep going. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, you know, so, so the, the thing that I think is, is, you know, really important is to think about these things. And Mercer does a really great job with this, right? As do you on your work on black buying power, to think about these things as narratives, right? You, you, you have to begin these discussions with a discussion, the language that you like to use, which, which I find really compelling, of propaganda, right? Or just, you know, I think of bedtime stories, right? These constant recurring narratives about how one goes about securing emancipation and getting free. And, and capitalism, contrary to what we imagine oftentimes on the academic left, capitalism is always a part of these formulations in some 
in some significant degree because most people are like, look, we don't have the, the means to you know, have armed revolutionary struggle. We're not gonna necessarily be able to sustain anything beyond you know, helping to maximize and build communities through the market logics that we've already been given. So most people are going through their day-to-day -day lives trying to find ways to build what they can from these capitalist arrangements and relationships, right? So if you think about the 19th century or 18th century relative to chattel slavery, the 20th century relative to housing, we ought not be surprised when you see people working within these various economic arrangements to try to then create these niches of black autonomy and self-determination, right, right, right? Right, right? The problem is that the game is rigged, right? So in the case of housing, you have African Americans who are looking to secure home ownership, in some cases rental properties, and what many of them are constantly running up against is the fact that the minute that wealth begins to accumulate by virtue of you know equity that they're trying to pay into properties, by virtue of African Americans who are you know creating these constellations of institutions and networks and businesses, that white folk or other folks with the wherewithal recognize these as pools of capital capital move in and then begin to exploit these various collectivities, right? So, so the story of Jim Crow segregation is not one simply about separation, but it's about separation under the umbrella of white domination and control, right? And, and so there's a sense among many African Americans that if we just get the separation part right, somehow then we'll be able to stop the white domination part. The problem is that white domination part is structural, right? And so whenever you think about- I'm And penetrates. Oh yeah, it penetrates like, these, these so various- you can't just set up these safe enclaves no. of blackness or whateverness. Never that, and, never and that. And think you're going to overcome this inability to isolate to overcome. Right, right. So, 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 so yeah. people are very good, and this is, and this is actually some of my, my more recent work now that I'm, you know, doing, trying to write a really intimate look at what happens when, you know, very um, well-meaning people of African descent mi migrate from the Caribbean to Europe, from Europe to North America, from in various corners of the United States. You know, wherever wherever Black folk decide to migrate, mm -hmm. there's pretty soon thereafter a recognition that there's a market there, right? right? That you can find ways to extract high profit margins by way of either durable goods, by way of rents, by way of other kinds of exploitation, certainly, you know, fleecing and underground economies, right? There's a real recognition, frankly, that like wherever two black people are gathered, therein is a market, right? right. And, and, and so I think part of what happens, and this is where Mercer's book is really, you know, telling is that these black banks basically end up becoming these reservoirs for them predation later on, right? right. The Freedmen's Bank, as she, as she explains, and as Abram Harris explained far earlier in the 1930s, right? That was a place where, you know, all of the black wealth in America was in this post-emancipation institution and a series of white bankers were like, oh, look, we can now use this to buy junk railroad stock, which they did in 1873, right? Black banks in general are seen as being places where you can have larger Wall Street banks simply peddle their products in the confines of these black communities, right? And so a lot of the so-called black-owned banks are now subsidiaries of the bigger firms that are down in Wall Street, right, as we now know. And this is where Mercer's work is really compelling. For me, you know, I think it's really just... And they're also just simply put, trading in limited, woefully limited pools of resources. Right. So when you're talking about people pooling their resources in black banks, black people don't have resources at the levels I think we're misguided into thinking mm -hmm. we have or, or propagandizing. So when you even try to do that, they're not the banks themselves, even if they were were trying to do something progressive or revolutionary, even are not dealing with the levels of of, of, of resources that would be required to overturn the inequality that exists. Right. And, and they're relatively small, as you were just pointing out right. before I interrupted you, no, no, no. These, these bigger Wall Street banks now. Right, and, 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 that, and that to me is one, one of the big lessons that needs to always come out of you know, a, a close look at, say, race and political economy is like, look, it's big capital versus small capital, right? In, in, in most cases, it's, it's almost never socialism versus capitalism. Right, it ends right, up being right, like right, small right, capital right, versus big right, capital, right, right, and that plays out the same way every single time, right? right? I mean, it, it's it's like a drumbeat. And so, you know, in, in, in the absence of- Is that a Jay-Z line? Big bank to little <laughs> I mean, bank? I mean, really. I mean, I mean so, you know, if, 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 we, if we know that that's the template and you're still telling people, create these small pockets of capital without actually changing the political procedures that make banking, you know, what it is as a largely predatory endeavor, that make real estate, you know, based on segregation and the belief that equity is somehow the way in which you're supposed to somehow secure a nesting in the future, rather than investing in robust public sector institutions, having programs that are in place for education, you know, helping people with nutrition, you know, childcare, you know, and so forth. Like, there, there's a way in which
which, you know, by encouraging privatization as the model, you basically have created this landscape of small capitalists that are always going to be gobbled up by big capitalists, right? And, and so, so much of what I try to do is say, look, we tried a version of this, believe it or not, in the so-called high age of like Keynesian, you know, centralized managed economy, you know, great growth liberalism, all that stuff that we think of as being the place we have to now get back to in the post 1970s era. Like, let's get back to really good, solid mid 20th century liberalism. Like that was the Jim Crow economy. Right. We, we have this weird pining for like the way in which, you know, you had governments that could manage resources and they manage resources by driving interstates through black communities, by setting up various forms of asymmetrical policing, by creating obviously, you know, a dual set of institutions as the only way that most white Americans would even buy into the New Deal or buy into post-war growth was on a segregated basis, right? So all these things that the state helped to manage, which were, again, Jim Crow, pro-growth, displacement, that's kind of like not what we should be thinking about as the model for the 21st century economy or so how the end of, you know, what some are calling the neoliberal moment is to get back to an era of big centralized economic planning that was largely done at the behest of white interests in, in general and certainly the white capital in particular. Um, and so I, I, I feel it is, is very important, as much as we are able, to really go back and revisit some of the older debates about, um, you know, what exactly were the day-to-day -day compromises, existences, you know, trade-offs that define the Jim Crow era. But then also, you know, just to make a comparative point, what is it about the U.S. that has, in fact, long been deeply colonial and very much connected to the international processes that were, you know, hemming in the folks of the Caribbean, Latin America, Africa, and so forth? To me, it seems that there's a lot more possibility analytically, politically, and, and, and elsewhere um, in the conversation if we actually don't get caught up in a, a kind of, you know, pining for mid-20th century liberalism and its various promises, you know? So... Would you then argue that as at least part of the plan, if there was ever going to be a move to fix any of this legitimately, that there has to be a political endeavor here, that that what whatever ism we want to call it, there right. has to be some sort of intentional policy driven redistribution of wealth or resources to to to, to overturn all this inequality, right? Yes. I mean it, it it, in, in other words, it can't just be an issue of agency, an issue of financial literacy, an right. issue of, right. uh, I don't know, just, just choosing to be ignorant as, opposing, as opposed to, uh, you know, being smart with our money. I right. Mean, it, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, one of the things that I, that I always find most striking when I go back and I read you know, writings from Victorian era black folk, right? So late 19th, early 20th century black folk who are saying in the high age of lynching in an era that's undeniably shaped by colonialism, segregation, white supremacy, they're basically saying that don't blame anybody else for your predicament, just manage your money, right? right. Behave ethically right. and morally, right. right? I mean, it's the exact same kinds of um, encouragements and admonitions and advises that people are getting of how you basically get free, right? And it's the same underlying logic, which is understandable on a level, which is at least in part saying, I don't want to go into war with these people. I don't want any more conflict with these people that are lynching us and burning us mm -hmm. and putting us on railways and all this other kind of stuff. I don't want, so if, if, the, if it's easier, I think, for mm -hmm. people to say, Focus on yourself, right? Left. Left. Yeah. Focus on yourself. Focus on your own behavior, and don't worry about these white folks or the the, the whoever. Yeah. And just change your own behavior, and you will get better. And it, it's easy, and it's that same current that you hear today. Yeah. And and it's a, a way of avoiding a conflict. Right. That, however you want to look at it, is on some level necessary, political or otherwise. I think there has to be. The, there needs to be some sort of change to the, the policy, the direction that, that, that is being taken here. And it isn't just about, at least for me, people's behavior. Yeah, no, I mean, I, to, to, honestly, man, I think about, like, if, you, if the language is similar between, you know, the Victorian era and this new Gilded Age that some are calling it, right? Mm -hmm. 
then, then that to me is the first indication as a historian that the structures are actually probably similar as well, right? That there, there's actually a lot more that's hemming people in that they might not be able to see or fully understand, but that's forcing them to make these kinds of arguments that, as you said, are conflict averse, that are, are outside of the realm of the political. Like our, our political process is actually so jammed up and so intractable that people consider political education to largely be a waste of time, right? Right? Um, and, that, and, and, we, and we don't think about whether or not it's possible, say for instance, to think out of the two-party structure, like that's considered to be crazy talk, right? Or right. to think about, you know, for instance, people are now starting to bring back what has been, you know, a very important and, and deep uh, debate in this country around a job guarantee, a federal job guarantee, right? right? Let's, let's actually make the federal government responsible for being that final level of security for those who are actively looking for right. work. There's no constitutional guarantee to employment or housing right. or health care. Right, right. <laughs> but, but, but again, we're all supposed to be rational, yeah. self-maximizing individuals in this republic, right? Without basic, you know, needs being met much of the time. Um, and so that there's, a, there's a contradiction there even between how we imagine the political process to work and whether we can support people enough to simply be you know, discerning folk um, with their vote. But all this to say, man, I think that you know, it's, it's absolutely the case that you have to do a number of things now that are in the realm of the political that are about really basic public sector investments, you know, thinking about how much of our taxing and, and our, our tax structure goes to really in, in uncritical ways toward military spending and not towards social spending. And this is obviously an old talking point, but it actually has a connection in this earlier period oh, where... Oh, man. If we just saw somebody looking for, for change for some charity at a stoplight... <laughs> And yeah. the one main reason why, and I get this from a buddy of mine, I'm, yeah. I can't even claim this, but the main reason I don't give to these charities to speak to this point about where the taxes go right. is that in my own, all of us right. have already contributed to a 23 or so trillion dollar GDP. Yeah, oh yeah. And then that's about the amount of money that the Pentagon just admitted to having lost, yeah. quote unquote, lost since 1980. Right. Right. <laughs> So there's all this money flying around, or, yeah. or what we hear about the six or seven hundred billion annual uh, tax amount of taxes that big corporations like GE don't pay right. every year. So in other words, the 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 money has been generated. The resources have already been generated mm -hmm. to take care of everything. Oh yeah, everything. No, no question. So I don't no want to be asked to donate nothing right to anybody because we have already contributed to all this money. So the question just is for me. Who's getting all that money? Right. And how does it get redistributed so that we don't have all of this? This There's no reason for anybody to be suffering. We have already, anyway. No, no, but, but, get off my soapbox. <laughs> no, no but, but, but this is really important because what, where, where, where we are now is we've been conditioned, you know, and, and really hemmed into the point where we think about our identity as taxpayers in largely conservative ways. How do I reduce my tax exposure, right? right? right. This is how all of us as, as kind of, you know, right. a atomized capitalists are encouraged to think about this with our various, you know, mutual funds or whatever it is we try to do relative to our local communities, right? right. My wages as a worker. I mean, I, I, right. I was at a union meeting, you know, about two or three months ago with Catch, like, why am I paying union dues? I want to be able to take my money home, right? It's like, there's no sense of there being- That's why you pay union dues, <laughs> right? right? There's there's no point. To get you those wages. So, so even the identity within, you know, nominally working class circles is one which I need to bring home as much money as I can, and then through my own discernment as individual, we'll be able to maximize goods and services, right? And that's not how this any of this works at all, right? And, and that in fact, if you, we were to adopt a somewhat progressive stance as taxpayers, which was actually a feature of the Jim Crow era, African Americans saying, you know what? If we're going to be paying taxes into the local community chest, we definitely need to have better beach accommodations. We definitely you know because our kids are literally drowning, right, by swimming in rock pits. We definitely need to have have better seating in these public venues, you know, where we're paying civic money into building stadiums and such. Like, you literally got Jim Crow seating in stadiums because the public funding was going into building stadiums, like today, right? So, so this is not a, 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 an entirely different or foreign place, but it's the way that we've been trained to argue has changed so dramatically. Has changed so dramatically. So we're now all arguing in this Victorian mode of like, yeah, well, I simply want to reduce my tax exposure and keep my resources, but in fact saying, no, your tax money is and this is again where, where Mercer's work is, is also key. It's actually a vote relative to how the financial sector should operate because exactly. so much of that is being dri driven by public money. It's it, your, your tax payment is a vote into how we can, should be able to talk about American you know military spending or public school spending or what kind of tax breaks are going to developers in, in these other areas, right? I mean, but we've instead said that we're going to abdicate 
that buy-in or that kind of you know basis of authority on the promise that the next election will be the articulation of our our, our desires and wishes. But that game is also largely yeah. pre- pre- predetermined, right? So so it's like we basically surrender. And, and again, the the irony of this in a capitalist moment, we've actually surrendered the power that capitalists always try to wield, which is power over the political process. Right, that's it. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's the so, point I always find is frustrating about these discussions that because they're so rarely. Uh, they so rarely happen openly and honestly, mm. but but that that the elite have uh, geographically, whether it's even in like neighborhoods like this, mm. or whether it's 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 uh, economically, it's public policy that has driven the inequality. It's right. not. It is not. I mean, they use government. They're always the, right. the, the, the always. claim is that they don't want government, always. but they use big government to set the policies that that you know. That do everything right. from from setting the value of the money in their pocket and our bank accounts to uh, um, uh, you know interest rates to tariffs to, to benefit themselves. I mean all kinds of stuff, and then it's just to allocate where our taxes go, right. like all these missing trillions of dollars that yeah. disappeared in the Pentagon. Yeah. Um, look, before we wrap up, because I, I, unfortunately we got to pull this to a close here in yeah. a minute, but there was I want to. Do a quick, somewhat transition. Obviously, say anything else you would want to say in, in conclusion. But, but one question I did want to ask, and I want to ask more people who have these visits with us, is what one, what is maybe one, what are some things at least that are at the top of your list that you would want to tell people about academia who may not be familiar with wow. what it's really like to be in wow. academia? And somewhat similarly, what would you say to yourself? Or to someone starting out, coming maybe in college right now, wanting thinking about their career, thinking about becoming a professor or a professional academic of some kind. Right. What would you say to him, that younger Nathan? Right. Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, or I was trying to think of the female cognate, like the like for a young woman coming out, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. Nathaniel, like, <laughs> like Natalia, something like that. But anyway, what would yeah. you say to him or her? Because uh, I know I would have I would have loved to have heard from someone like me mm. 20 some odd years ago when I was right. contemplating this career and now realizing how wildly wrong I was on so many levels about it. But right. but anyway, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. So so, you know, the first thing I would I would say about the um, nature of this business in terms of being a, a working scholar and an academic is that, um, you know, don't believe the conservative talking points that the academy is a place full of left-leaning, you know, radicals <laughs> and, and, and progressives, right? Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's crazy to think about how, you know, people just accept this mantle as if somehow we're living in this world that is one, you know, somehow outside of very clear, um, you know, parameters of market-driven approaches of one kind or another that are, you know, really where capital still has a considerable amount of influence. Mm. Um, and also, you know, that it's a place where it's, that somehow black politics or subaltern politics are really clean and unencumbered, right? <laughs> and you can somehow create these utopias within, you know, black studies programs or within other kinds of, oh, you know, ethnic, ethnic program formations, right? Um, you know, people are... Um, deeply driven still by self-interest. Um, there, there's a really important way that we need to understand how mm. institutions of higher education are, um, in some cases, trying as best they can to not make questions of race and inequality places of scholarly innovation and applications mm. of knowledge, right? Mm. I mean, I, I've been a part of a number of different you know, conversations and, and seen institutions that are really good and aggressively trying to do the best work in cancer research out in the world, the best clean water procurement out in the world, the best kinds of, you know, accounting practices and, and, and business, you know, MBA training that goes out into the world. And yet all the people who do work on race, inequality, you know, political economy and its various, you know, discontents, we're all told to basically, you know, write in obscure journals and to deal in, in very, you know, small, finite confines and not being supported in ways that would actually, you know, apply and institutionalize our research. And mm. so what ends up happening is we have a series of conversations that wind up being 90, 100 years old. We're like, wow, C.L.R. James said the same thing back in 1930 or wow. wow. Isn't it amazing how, you know, Sylvia Winter was on, you know, these ideas about colonialism and womanhood and we had, 
you know, we, we already had this apparatus in place. Why is it nobody knows about black reconstruction, right? So we go First back. of all, just real quick, I don't think anybody has said anything Sylvia Winter hasn't covered. By the way. Just, and I was very late to her work, and I'm mad that I was that late. But that's what I'm saying. She so. is so dope, man. So, yeah, anyway, my bad. No, no, no. So, so we end up having these moments, right? There are these moments of awakening, like, wow, you know, somebody already said this thing. And so, right. And so, and so what, what, what we're not doing is use the 19th century forms of medical technology, right, largely. Like, what we're not doing I hope, right. is, is, yeah. is using, you know, 18th century forms of transportation, by and large. And yet, you know, we're being expected to just, like, not really advance and apply, and apply the knowledge in the field. So I, I really would encourage people, man. I mean, it's hard because I know you have to serve multiple, you know, constituencies and you have to try to find ways to get income. And again, the rules of capitalism definitely still apply. Yeah, I mean, you can take, a, take another lap if you want. Oh, okay, um, all right. And, um, you know, it, it is, I think, the, the, the realities of just having to support a household are, are, are very real. But at the same time, man, I think people should be really trying to push as much as they can to, um, you know, make institutions of higher education places that will finally, you know, be about the applied innovations in our various fields, right? Discourse analysis, understanding, you know, racism's evolution, understanding, you know, the intersectionality, right, of oppressions, all of that stuff that we talk about in blogs and whatnot. Like, what does it mean to have hiring practices at institutions of higher education that are explicitly anti-racist, right? Right, what, right, what, right? What 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 would it mean to have, you know, ways of, again, encouraging public sector investment um, that we're not seeing right now, but that we all know is what's basically necessary. Um, so that, so that's, that I think the first thing is that, you know, the academy is actually a place where progressive ideas go to, to die. Um, and we have to be very aware of that. They, they get ossified or they get, you know, turned into, you know, uh, curiosities that go into the cabinet, but they're not really, <laughs> you know, um, living and breathing out in the world in the way that they could be if we had different kinds of institutions of higher education. So that's the first thing related to that, you know, relative mm. to my, to myself, um, you know, I, I came to this work, man, a lot of people don't know this about me, but, but um, I, I came from a Catholic back, background. And so a lot of what I do um, in terms of studying inequality and thinking about um, the questions that I do has to do with the fact that I came from a faith tradition. Um, and, you know, I believe that in those who have certain kinds of talents and resources are bound by that um, endowment to serve. And so I see my scholarship as very much um, in service of, you know, broader visions and, you know, hopefully democratic and emancipatory possibilities. Again, it's hard because, you know, you have to really do that stuff. But, you know, my, my, my dreams of what a dissertation could do were so lofty right when I first came out that I put a lot of pressure on that as an intellectual exercise. I think even my, my first book was, was something that I hoped would probably do more out in the world than an, an academic oh, book and an academic oh. press can do, right? You know, uh, <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, and, and I think even now, as I experiment with new genres, right, doing podcasting, trying to work in digital media, these kinds of things, you know, I, I, I'm constantly having to, in some ways, remind myself of that lesson, being like, okay, this is a way of reaching people. But this is not going to take the place of very, you know, deliberate kinds of support for political work, actual execution of political work, you know, the, the enabling of political work, um, and that I shouldn't get those projects confused, you know, um, and just to be very honest and, and aware of that. Um, I think, you know, that I came up in an age, as did you, man, where like, you know, the black male public intellectual was just out there on TV and, and, and in, a lot of, in a lot of ways now that's become just the dominant way of, of presenting black knowledge and intellectual life, which is sad. Um, you know, gone are the days where people actually go into institutions and communities and do painstaking brick building incremental institutional work, you know, and that to me is, you know, what I try to do in my, my professional life, you know, apart from whatever I do out in the world is to try to, you know, win these various, you know, battles of position and say, okay, if we're going to try to build an anti-racist institution, we got to be thinking in terms of 50 years from now. And, and so it's not like a lot of what I hope will, will come relative to our political world or our learning worlds um, in higher ed won't be realized in my lifetime. I'm actually fully aware of that. But I'm also aware that my job is to you know, try to get us a little bit closer to that so that when folks are coming behind, they can say, OK, well, wait a minute. We've actually got we're not we're not starting from you know, zero anymore. Or, or, or I, I don't I don't I don't want people coming to my book being like, gosh, Connolly said in a world more concrete, all the stuff I'm thinking right, about right, now right, in 2070. Right, you know right, what I mean? Like that would that right. would I would take that as an L personally, if I somehow blew some kid's mind, you know, 80 or 100 years from now. Right. Like that's not what the work is really about. It's about making it getting us to the point where it should be totally 
totally common sense to imagine, for instance, that colonialism rather than liberalism is the way we need to understand the global predicament, right? Um, or that you know we shouldn't think about there being emancipation available by way of capitalism. That in fact you need to go in and say it's the capitalism isn't the answer at all, but it's political process, political education, and that's and that's a diff, that's an entirely different axis along which we should then build our politics. You know, so all this to say, man, it's like I would hope that we're not fighting the same fights a uh, hundred years from now for sure. Well, Dr. Nathan Connolly, thank you very much <laughs> for joining me in this edition of Academics and Cars. Thank you all for watching. Oh, thank you. Check us out at imixwhatilike.org, at imixwhatilike for all your relevant social media. You can find other uh, interviews and exchanges with Professor Connolly and links to his work. And uh, he mentioned Garvey, so I'll mention him here. Uh, we always say, like Fred Hampton said, peace if you're willing to fight for it. Mm -hmm. And like Garvey said, we'll catch you in the whirlwind. So peace if you're willing to fight for it. And catch you in the world with man. Right. Thanks a lot. Man. Peace out. All right. <laughs> All right. What I like, what I like, what I like.